It's been a while since I started making web games in JavaScript. In this video, I'd like to share tips that would be helpful for beginners wanting to do the same. So the tip number one is to learn JavaScript outside of game development alongside HTML and CSS. This might sound obvious, but I really recommend learning to program before learning game dev. For JavaScript, that means learning the fundamentals of the language and how it integrates with HTML and CSS. Considering that JavaScript is primarily used on the web to make websites and web apps, I recommend that your first few projects be web related and not game related. Game development has a lot of domain specific knowledge to grasp. A beginner would easily be overwhelmed with having to learn programming, programming in JavaScript, HTML and CSS to make the web page on which the JavaScript will run and game development all at once. You don't have to learn everything in JavaScript either, just the core fundamentals. You learn more obscure features during practice when building projects. Tip number two, learn that there are two JavaScripts, the one that runs in Node.js and the one that runs on the web. For some time, JavaScript was relegated to a scripting language used for making web pages built using HTML and CSS interactive. However, when the Node.js runtime was released, it allowed devs to run JavaScript outside of the browser on their machines. Similarly to other languages like C Sharp, Python, Java, etc. This enabled JavaScript to be used for more than just websites. There were now two major environments where JavaScript could run, in the browser and in Node.js. When creating a server side or a command line application, you would write JavaScript that would run directly on the user's machine with Node.js. However, even for JavaScript that was intended to run on a web page, you would still use Node.js not to run the code, but to install tools useful for transforming your JavaScript before it runs on a web page. This is due to an innovation that was brought with Node.js, the ability to download packages directly from a package manager called NPM, which stands for Node Package Manager. The days where you needed to import a library by linking it using a script tag in your HTML were over. These tools called bundlers would bundle the libraries you installed via NPM alongside your JavaScript code and compile them into a single compact JavaScript file that could run within a web page. Developers would also write a more ergonomic version of JavaScript that had features not supported by browsers since they relied on the bundler to transpile whatever they wrote into JavaScript that was browser supported. For example, React, arguably the most popular library for building web UIs, allows you to author UI components in an easy fashion by using an HTML-like syntax within your JavaScript called GSX. However, GSX is not valid in JavaScript. That's why the bundler will transform your JavaScript code using GSX into JavaScript code that doesn't, so it can run in the browser while retaining the same functionality. At the end of the day, what can be done with GSX can still be done in regular JavaScript, but in a more verbose way. That's why we let bundlers deal with it to make our lives easier. All this to say that today, most JavaScript developers use a dev setup built around using Node.js and NPM, even if the intended code is to run in the browser and not in Node.js. For game dev, that implies installing Node, using a build tool like Vite, installing your game framework slash libraries via NPM, and compiling slash transpiling your code to a version that can run on the web, in the browser more specifically. This is often called your build. This build is what you deploy on your website or on platforms like itch.io. You get a more streamlined experience from this setup since your Node.js based project keeps track of your library's versions via a file called package.json. That means that updating a library is just one command away. You have access to hot reloading, meaning every time you modify your code, the change is immediately reflected, which is a game changer for game dev, since this allows you to iterate quickly. And finally, a local server is spun up automatically for you so that you can preview your project easily. The old way of doing things is still available if you wish to avoid that complexity. 
For example, you can download the JavaScript file for the library you want to use, link it to your HTML using a script tag, and finally install an extension like Live Server in the VS Code Editor to benefit from a local server and hot reloading. However, you'd still need to manually keep track of what version of the library you're using and manually have to download new versions and replace the existing ones in your projects folder, which can become tedious. The third tip I have is to stick to 2D since 3D is more complicated. While using JavaScript for 2D games is viable, for 3D it's a different story. It's very hard to compete with modern engines like Unity and Unreal, which are more suited for creating 3D games and abstract away a lot of the complexity that comes with 3D. However, there are still 3D focused libraries like 3GS, but they are more suited for 3D experiences that lives on a web page rather than a full fledged game. I concede that it's still possible to make a good looking 3D game if you're able to come up with a unique art direction. As an idea, you could try replicating the HD. 2D art style of Square Enix, putting 2D sprites into a low poly 3D world and adding a bunch of post processing effects. The fourth tip is to pick a framework slash library. Games made in JavaScript are rendered within the HTML canvas element of a web page. By default, you have access to the canvas API allowing you to render graphics. For those unfamiliar, it's similar to using Pygame or Love2D, where you have to basically write most things from scratch. While this is very good for learning and you learn knowledge that is transferable to other lower level game dev environment, for example, you could you will gain knowledge that can be transferred over to Pygame, Love2D or Raylib. I don't think it's the way to go for beginners. At least it depends on why you're doing game dev. If you like the technical challenges that comes with making a game, using no libraries could be more fulfilling, but unfortunately time consuming. However, if you care about results, meaning having finished games, it would be wiser to use a framework or a library that offers a lot out of the box. As a beginner, you'll be more likely to finish projects with which will in turn increase your motivation and increase the likelihood that you stick with game dev in the long term if you pick a framework slash library. I just want to mention that by library, I mean a library that offers a lot out of the box because, you know, Raylib is also a library, but it's pretty bare bones and P5JS as well. So Kaple is a library that has a lot out of the box. Phaser is a framework that has a lot out of the box. However, as opposed to using an engine like Unity, Godot, Unreal. Using a framework or a library with a lot out of the box still allows you to architect your code base with a greater degree of freedom because it prevents you from spending too much time learning how specific game engine workflows work and, and UIs, basically. For JavaScript, I recommend going with Kaple due to its simplicity and intuitive API. So this is the library I just mentioned previously. And I have a video explaining the library in five minutes that you can watch next if you want. A link will be in the description. For something more established, Phaser is the dominant player. Say it's a framework. It is more performant, even though it has a steeper learning curve. Now for tip number five or six, use a map editor like Tiled and or LDTK. So manually placing objects in your game via code will get tedious quickly and make you wish you used a proper game engine. Fortunately, there is a solution. You can use a map editor like Tiled or LDTK to create your game's levels slash maps visually like you would in a game engine. I really recommend investing the time to learn how to use one because it saves you a lot of time. Now the next tip is to stick to one tutorial start to finish. When getting started you might be tempted to follow a project based tutorial. There is nothing wrong with that. Just stick with it from start to finish. Don't hop between different tutorials. Doing this will only slow down your progress. Once you have completed following along with the tutorial you can start building an original project that heavily leverages what was taught in the tutorial. It's at that stage that you actually learn. Before that, you're only getting exposed to various concepts without them being consolidated in your mind. So next is learn pixel art. Your game will sooner or later need graphics. At first, there is nothing wrong with using ready-made asset packs. I have some, by the way, in the description if you're interested. However, I think it's worth the investment to learn how to make good pixel art since you'll be able to make the sprites you need without having to be dependent on an asset pack existing for your particular use case. A nice intermediate step between using asset packs and making your own sprites 
from scratch is to modify existing asset packs. This is actually very helpful in gradually developing an understanding of what makes good pixel art. So it, you will actually improve in pixel art by doing this. Learning to modify asset packs well is also very useful when you need to use multiple ones for a single project as it will allow you to make everything look consistent. In terms of the software I use, I use a sprite. It's the most popular option. However, it doesn't really matter what software you use as long as it works for you. Pixel art is an art form where you have the highest likelihood of making something that passes the professional quality bar in a reasonable amount of time. That's why it's my go-to art style and that's why I do recommend it. So I recommend checking my pixel art for programmers video next for more tips. You will also find this in the description. Next is to make small games first. This is now the standard advice parroted online, but by making small games, you're more likely to finish a project. This will in turn motivate you to continue game development and increase your skills for the next project, so on and so forth. If you lack ideas, try remaking existing simple games like Pong, Duck Hunt, etc. I have tutorials on my channel you can follow also. Before we wrap up this video, I would like to talk about the deployment of your games. So I recommend publishing your games not only on your own website if you have one, but on platforms like itch.io where people interested in games congregate. For itch.io, you might find it hard to find players initially if you just upload your game and leave it there. That's why I recommend joining game jams and making your games as part of the game jam and submitting them and you'll be more likely to get feedback on your games by players, other game devs or other people who are enthusiastic about itch.io games. Unfortunately, ways to successfully monetize web game development are rather limited. However, I would like to tell you that you're not limited to the web when making games in JavaScript. You can transform your JavaScript web game into a desktop app that can be sold on Steam, the number one platform where people sell and buy games. The simplest way I have found of achieving this was to use the NW .js technology, which is very similar to the more popular Electron, but much simpler to use. I have an exclusive step-by-step -step tutorial on my Patreon teaching you how to make a downloadable desktop space shooter game with Kaplay and NW.js for Mac, Windows, and Linux. The link will be in the description if you're interested. I hope these tips were useful for anyone wanting to make games in JavaScript. And uh, if you are interested in more content like this, uh, game dev and JavaScript, uh, feel free to subscribe to not miss out when I publish new videos. Thanks for watching, and I'm hoping to see you in another video. Bye.